as Judy told you, three books about the people I work with and live with for my almost my entire life. I hope not all of it yet. <clears throat> anyway, I'll start off. And most of these stories took place in Manchester. Some of them Dorset, some other places, but I sort of kept to Manchester today because we're in Manchester. The Quality Restaurant was opened in December of 1920. It was the favorite eating place in Manchester for over 50 years. Its owners and operators were Mr. and Mrs. Clarence Comer. They were both immortalized by Norman Rockwell, he in a large painting that used to hang over the family table in the, in the Quality, where <clears throat> local contractors and businessmen congregated for morning coffee. And she, in the famous Saturday Evening Post cover titled The Gossips, also by Norman Rockwell. Many of the stories in this poem took place in that haven for the hungry and thirsty. George Roberts, the owner of a garage opposite Fieldstone Bandstand that used to occupy the little park just north on Route 7, once actually just south of Route 7, um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, George once ordered an iced tea, only to find that the Comer's son and heir had forsaken their delicious brewed tea for the instant variety. His yowl to Pete Comer still echoes in Manchester. God, <laughs> Pete, please pour this back in the horse. <laughs> It never ceases to amaze me how some people have the ability to rise to the occasion despite stressful and unforeseen circumstances that insert themselves into an otherwise normal situation. Such a man was Leo Grout. This stalwart citizen was a large and rugged individual, soft-spoken and purposeful in all his daily chores. He had worked all his life to support himself and his family, and his only apparent sin was an occasional pipe full of tobacco. Leo was in the garage business with his son Ed in the late 1950s and early 60s in South Dorset, which is, I live in the town of Dorset. And they were also dealers for case, farm equipment, and earth moving equipment. One warm summer evening, this kind man took his family to the movie playing at, the time, at that time in the old Manchester Playhouse that no longer exists as a theater in the village. Leo was not a man of sartorial persuasion and almost always wore bib overalls. <clears throat> After the show, the attendant crowd was in the usual press to exit the theater when his wife whispered to him that his zipper was, <clears throat> in, uh, was in the down position. At that moment, Leo was directly behind a very large woman in a gingham dress, which gave him a screen to correct the problem. As luck would have it, a vagrant breeze in the lobby billowed her dress at the exact moment that the open fly was yanked up to its closed position. This, there was apparently no way to reverse the zipper, so with the patience and originality born into such resolute souls, the senior grout dug deep in his pocket, produced and opened a sharp Barlow jackknife grabbed a handful of surplus fabric and severed the connection. <laughs> the sight of the retreating matron with a large irregular hole in the rear of her raiment was only slightly less uproariously funny than the vision conjured up of her attempting to persuade her family that she didn't know how such a disaster happened <laughs> during an evening in the cinema. <laughs> and, and there were some great people that here. Irving Lee was an elderly but sprightly man when I first started my electrical business. His movements were always quick and sure, as were his dealings, financial and otherwise. He bought and sold properties long before this area was overrun by realtors, and the exchange of land became so popular and so expensive. Mr. Lee would buy some derelict house, put some of his own work and that of the trades into a generally cosmetic revamp, and then peddle it to a, bur a, at, a buyer at a modest profit. On a fall day in the late 50s, this gentleman flagged me down and said, Mr. Tyler, I have bought the Hughes place on McNamara Road and no wiring is in it. How much will it cost to put electric in? Just one light? One, pot, one outlet for plugging in in each room. 
Also, will you have the power people put the cable to the house? I went up to the building, looked it over carefully, and went back to place the place where he was working. Bell, how much? And my tobacco chewing customer. I replied, I could do the whole job for $800. This was 50 years ago. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I just didn't want anybody to hold me to that price. <laughs> <clears throat> I replied I could do the whole job for $800. The next query was, that sounds okay, now how much for cash? <laughs> I quoted him a slightly reduced price and received this advice. You go ahead and do the job, my boy, and I want you to know, always remember that what Irving Lee told you today, cash has no name. When the job was done, I was paid $750 cash. <laughs> Another character, Dana Thompson, was chief of police in Manchester until that horrible December night in 1972 when he was shot to death by a druggie named Baddock. This outlaw had been cornered in Whipple's drugstore while in the act of robbing it. Dana was a soft-spoken, kindly gentleman who was universally liked and respected by all who knew him. I prefer to remember his many kindnesses to us green rookie cops and also to the young people of the area. His sense of humor was as dry as the pipe that was his constant companion. I was riding with him one winter Sunday in the, in the late 60s when we pulled over into the parking lot in front of Wilcox Fuels, which is now Door Oil. It was not a very cold day, so we rolled down the window in the cruiser so we could hear as well as watch the snowmobiles hurtling around the racetrack at the recreation area. We hadn't been there long before an elderly lady drove up beside the cruiser and asked, Mr. Thompson, whatever is going on over there? We were watching the snowball ra races, ma'am, he said, pointing. My goodness, she said, how long have they been racing those things? And Dana's answer was, I think that they, they built the second one. <laughs> <laughs> Kit and Angie were just out together and went to Alfie's nightclub one evening for, the little, for a little dancing and watching the fun. The place was, as usual, overflowing with all kinds and ages, enjoying the loud music and generally having a good time. About the middle of the evening, the girls went into the ladies' room and as they were preparing to leave, in swished an obvious society type of advancing years. She was bedecked with bracelets and rings and haughtily accosted them thus. Girls, in New York, they teach us to wash after using the facilities. To which Kim replied, in Vermont, they teach us not to pee on our hands. <laughs> A former town manager in our sister town, well, my sister town, Manchester, was George Randall. He also worked at least part-time for Fred Pabst at his famous Big Bromley ski area. Uh, Chris Sweezy told me that after a heavy snowfall, he had asked George how much accumulation they had on the mountain. His answer will ever be etched on this memory. Chris, the snow up there is crotch deep on a nine-foot Indian. <laughs> <laughs> Former town manager in our sister town, well, my sister town, Manchester, was George Randall. He also worked at least part-time for Fred Bapp, Pabst at his famous Big Bromley ski area. Uh, Chris Sweezy told me that after a heavy snowfall, he had asked George how much accumulation they had on the mountain. His answer will ever be etched on this memory. Chris, the snow up there is crotch deep on a nine-foot Indian. <laughs> Back in the 1950s, there was a man named Nelson Parkinson, known to his employers and co-workers as Parky. This man was an artist who could tape and spread tape joint cement to hide the nails and seams and sheetrock. Today, every contractor does his own taping or has one of his crew do the job. Also, the cement comes pre-mixed uh, to perfection in five-gallon tubs. But back then, it was bought in bags as a powder, and it was an art to mix it with water to the proper consistency. This was Parkey's field of expertise, and every contractor in our valley knew it. 
His services were much in demand, and because of this monopoly, he was spoiled, and we all had to put up with his idiosyncrasies. Parkey had his own unique speech pattern that does not lend itself to the printed word. Mm -hmm. Due to years of sanding his work and inhaling that fine dust, his voice sounded as if his adenoids were under his tongue, and he spoke in a hesitating nasal drone. One, one day he showed up at a house with that Walt Kerwin was renovating in North Dorset. As he was surveying the work, Parkey noticed the eight-foot ceiling was too high for him to reach, and he started complaining about it. To forestall any problems, Walt grabbed a youngster who was working for him by the name of Dick Lynch, a budding comedian and helper. He was told to go downstairs and build a stool that Mr. Parkinson could stand on and easily move around while the walls were being taped and traveled, troweled by our expert. Dick was sawing and hammering downstairs, and at coffee break, he delivered to the master the most finely crafted step stool any of us had ever seen. It had end pieces that were cut to fashion the four legs for stability, there were gussets and cross braces, and the top was cut out for a convenient handhold for carrying. Parkey said, thanks, Dick. It's great to find a kid that can do that nice work. A wink clued us in to wait for our sheetrock expert to proceed with the ceiling. His dishpan full of what he called poo-poo and wielding his wide trowel, Parky mounted his new pride and joy and leaned back for his first swipe at the ceiling. <clears throat> the stool folded silently and collapsed, dropping our taper to the floor with a crash and coating him with a gallon of goo. Amid screams of laughter, <laughs> amid screams of laughter, the stool had been completely assembled with number six finish nails. Everyone quickly dispersed, and Dick found other work in the garage. Mr. Parkinson's rage was expressed by a string of nasal oaths and a threat, threat that he would kill that little prick if he ever caught him. <clears throat> Cutler Severance was a former electrician and a man of quiet but razor-sharp humor. He seldom spent much time developing a story or making a point. He just pulled the trigger and shot from the hip. Skiers with their skis racked on top of their cars started pouring into our area on that concrete ribbon U.S. Route 7. These slat riders passed by, close by his house, so his neighbor and good friend Ted Hopkins asked him, what he thought of the parade. Cutler's reply stopped Ted Cole. They must be going to build something, Ted. They've all got lumber tied on top of their cars. <laughs> uh, Jeff Ede and his bride Jay came to Manchester from Chicago and with their pool resources purchased the old 1811 house up in the village. Their attorney for this venture was Buzz Eichel, a legal light, albeit somewhat dim, but the prop, uh, possessor of a studied wit. Soon all the paperwork had been signed, witnessed, and the previous owners had fled with every penny that the Eads had in this world or expected to earn in the foreseeable future. The newlyweds then asked their wise counselor if he had any advice to offer them. Buzz looked over his glasses at Jeff and cautioned, cautioned him, if she lays an egg, step on it. <laughs> The family table at the Quality was always full at morning break time. Some of the area's greats were ranged at that long booth on two benches which could accommodate an even dozen side to, six to a side. Hawk Dufresne, Don Powers, Chris Sweezy, Artie Witt, Gene Keata, George Heaslip, Howard Ambrose, John Batchelor, Bernie Wilcox, sometimes Milt Rockwell, King Reed, our voice in Montpelier yours truly, and assorted other local businessmen. The assembled group would each day match for the whole table's coffee. No food included, just a cup of coffee. I never did drink coffee, I drink tea, but that was in the, the same price. <laughs> the assembled group would each day match for the whole table's coffee. No other food. Uh, this particular day, Dufresne brought as his guest Father Jim Murray, 
the new priest who had been sent to Manchester in the 60s to build a new Catholic church. When the time came to pay, each side was to match until it was determined a winner, or loser if you will, and then the two losers would match. Although the cost of the group's coffee rarely exceeded a dollar because coffee at the time was 10 cents, we agreed that the priest should be excluded from the contest, which of course was gambling. <laughs> Jim would have none of it. He insisted upon being a part of his new community. So we proceeded with the flipping of coins, the result being that I was the goat on my side and the good father lost on his. Two coins shot up, I hollered match, and unfortunately the man of the cloth was stuck with the bill. <laughs> we were a little embarrassed, but Father Murray relieved the tension by declaring in his subtle brogue, I don't mind the money, but it's a trifle ignominious in degrading to lose to a Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> Dorset Town Constable, before I was, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and deputy sheriff for many years, Howard Brophy was also a friend and neighbor of Frank Benedict. Unfortunately, you may have heard this before, Bob. Uh, unfortunately, Howard was required by the legal mandate of his job to arrest his neighbor when he became intoxicated. When this occurred, he would transport his friend to Bennington Jail where he would be held overnight. The judge would usually penalize Mr. Benedict with a day in jail, consider it served, and then have Frank uh, Howard drive him home. This was a circumstance that inconvenienced no one, really. It seemed to preserve their friendship, and as a bonus, the constable was paid for his effort. Howard bought a small farm in East Dorset as an investment and determined to learn the ins and outs of farming. His family is always been, had always been storekeepers, so it was uphill work. Howard told me this tale years ago, and it is a favorite of mine. One fall day, he found he had a sick cow, and not wanting to spend the money for a vet, <clears throat> he, yeah, he called Frank to ask him what to do. Well, what's she doing, Frank asked. Well, she's down on her side and her tongue's out and she's lolling, came the answer. Well, where have you got on pasture? Well, up on the hill in the old orchard, said Howard. Has she been eating apples? Well, I guess she has, offered the cow's owner. Well, then sure as hell she's drunk, was the verdict. Frank, please, what shall I do with her? The answer came instantly. Take the son of a bitch to Bennington. That's what you always done with me. <laughs> 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 you can edit this if you want to. Uh, here's another one about Cutler's severance. He was a lifelong, stubborn, conservative Republican and left no doubt in anyone's mind as to his, his political philosophy. He was confined to Putland Hospital in Bennington for an undisclosed ailment that required surgery and the possibility of a blood transfusion. The doctor was explaining in detail the steps that were to be taken and was interrupted by this native Yankee. You cut where you have to, and as for the blood, I don't care whether it comes from a man who is white, black, yellow, or red, but if I ever vote Democrat after this, I'll come back and hunt you down. <laughs> <laughs> On a hot summer afternoon in the Manchester Baptist Church, an elderly lady of the town fainted. As she lay in the aisle, her eyes closed, Bob Brewster, a pillar of that congregation, and coincidentally the town's undertaker, leaned over the prostate figure. She opened her eyes, saw Bob, and asked, Be I dead? <laughs> in his book, Vermont Tales, our friend and former state senator, Fred Eric, tells of Lulu Wyman. Mrs. Wyman, at age 75 plus, was helping Fred when he was surveying a woodlot over in Beartown, which is a remote former settlement on the other side of Equinox Mountain. Each day, Mr. Eric would drive to Manchester, pick up Lulu at her home, retrace his route to Arlington, drive west to Sandgate Road, and thence about eight miles north to the Beartown lot. As he drove her home, Mrs. Wyman suggested it would be easier for him if she met him the next time at the site and save him the two round trips. 
The following weekend, Fred arrived at the lot early in the morning, and his helper was waiting for him. That evening, after a full day's surveying, Fred asked her where she'd parked her car, and Lulu replied she didn't own a car, and she'd walked for over from Manchester. Her journey over Beartown Notch had crossed the shoulder of Mount Equinox, requ requiring the septuagenarian to climb nearly 1,000 feet and then descend 800 feet to her destination for a total hike of six miles over that abandoned road. Fred, ever the gentleman, drove her home. <laughs> Is, and also, I had a note here. Is it any wonder that Lulu Wyman lived to be 101? Yeah. I came to respect Mr. Abner Blackmer, with whom I had uh, helped uh, work with and, and uh, built a house in Manchester. Despite our age difference, we had formed a bond of sorts. As long as he lived, he never failed to remind me of what he believed were truisms. At Ebers Taylor's auction in 1962, I arrived early and saw Ab Abner and his missus sitting on lawn chairs in the front row. I hastened down front, hailed them, stuck out my hand in greeting. Admiral looked up with a deadpan expression and a slight furrow in his brow and said, I'll shake your hand, boy, but there ain't no friends at an auction. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've bored you enough almost, I think, but I would like to tell you this story about Reed Lefebvre. I know some of you remember Reed. He was Southern Vermont's voice in our state legislature during the 50s and 60s. He was a far powerful but compassionate man who would, could sway votes and even reverse the assembly by his reasoned speech and good humor. His command of this language was beyond most of his fellow Solons, and yet he did not rub any noses in it. He was indeed one of the most respected members that ever served in that body. Reed had a way of cutting through the rhetoric that occasionally mired the house. At one strongly debated bill that was offered to dock any representative's pay for a day that they were not present, he rose to speak and was promptly recognized. He reasoned, Mr. Speaker, I would submit that many members contribute most generously on the days that they are absent. <laughs> the stories of Reed Lefebvre legend, both here in the Valley and also in the hallowed halls of Vermont State House. He rarely, if ever, missed an opportunity to address his, address his fellow legislators, but always in a good humor. St. Patrick's Day was one of his favorites, and one year on that date, he regaled two ethnic groups with the following poem that he had authored. It is the 17th of March today, a most important date, a date to be remembered and a day to celebrate. For the Irish in our nation, it's a holiday sublime, but Italians all around us are demanding equal time. It's the feast of St. Pasquale, Esposito said to me, and it's always celebrated by us sons of Italy. By De Bonis, Giuliani, Galli, Mazza, Franco II, Molinari, and Rotunda, just to name a scattered few. Just a minute, Esposito, I'm confused by what you say. It's the patties that we honor, not the Goombas here today. For the Burnses and Kernses, this is quite a special day. And for good old Renfrew Gallagher and James Shillelagh Shea, the O'Briens and the Ryans will be cooking up a deal with the Candons and the Fitzpatricks and with Mildred H. O'Neill. And we'll honor both the Kennedys, that Francis J. and P. and also Alan Richard Foley for the wearing of the green. They'll be singing Irish ballads with their voices raised so gaily, led by Irish Eddie Conlon, Johnny Burke, and Willie Daly. In the Senate, there's Jack Daly, and there's Crowley, and there's Kane, Dottie Shea, and Chuck Delaney, voices raised in sweet refrain. Yes, I once served in the Senate, and my memory takes me back to a fighting Irish senator I nicknamed Tiger Jack. Through the dust and smoke of history still hanging in the air, his name a hundred years from now will still be whispered there. These sessions come, these sessions go, no matter how we're faring. 
this house would be a duller place without the sons of Aaron. <laughs> and uh, I think that's probably a good place to stop. <laughs> stories and a lot more in them is small. It's just half the size of this. But at my advanced years, I don't see that. Uh. And so I had to enlarge it so that I could read it to you today. Very well done. And thank you, thank you very you much. For thank coming. you. Yes. And I apologize for anything that should have been edited. But I, <laughs> it's okay. just as it was said. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does anyone uh, have any questions that they would ask, yeah. like to ask Terry? Well, I have to say that I listen to you, I come and listen to you every time you talk, and it's something new every time. Mm -hmm. I, what? Is I come to listen to you oh. every time you make a talk, and it's something new every time. I hope that the no, disease is curable. <laughs> <laughs> and because I know the vet. Oh, I'm well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hey, but Jerry, did you get all of it? I hope so. I didn't embarrass you. No, not me. Okay. Yes, <laughs> <laughs>